afternoon and welcome. I am Felice Nave with the Jewish Federation of South Palm Beach County, and I'm so glad to welcome you to our Federation Live program with Dr. Robert Watson. It is wonderful to see the turnout for today's event. It's truly a record breaker. We see many familiar faces and many new people joining us today. Our virtual programs are among the many ways our Federation is reaching out to bring our community together as we also work to meet critical needs for our people. We are and will remain the community funder, planner, and convener. We are delighted that our campaign chair, Deborah Halperin, is with us today to share a few very important messages about our community. Thank you, Deborah. Um, good afternoon, I'm on. Thank you, Felice, and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, a huge thank you to Robert Watson for joining us today. No surprise that we have a, I would call it a sellout crowd on Zoom today. Um, our largest Federation program yet, knowing your fan base, I'm not surprised at all. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Um, each week we are getting stronger and stronger as we adapt to life around us. I am so proud to be sharing this time with all of you. And while maybe there are a few people who would want to be in my shoes right now as the chair of the annual campaign for our Jewish Federation of South Palm Beach County, if you know me, you know, I could not be more proud to hold that title today and always. Through good times and difficult times, our Federation is always there to respond on a moment's notice our annual campaign funds more than 70 partner agencies locally in Israel and around the world and enables us to respond immediately in times like these. Our agencies responding on the front lines of the COVID-19 crisis have been able to continue their work uninterrupted with the full support of our Federation. We continue to help feed the hungry care for the elderly, assist those with developmental disabilities, and so much more. Our needs are great and of course are growing and we are reaching wide to ask our community members to step up and help us support our work. No gift is too small or too big and will go a long way to reach those who need it most. If you would like to learn more about our Federation and about our community and to make a donation to support our vital work, please reach out to us. Our phones are checking in at 561-852-3100 or of course online at jewishboka.org slash donate. We will also provide this link at the end of this program for you. I also want to do one final plug before we begin our program for an exciting event that our Federation is hard at work on on Tuesday, May 5th. You'll be hearing more about it. We will be participating in a second Giving Tuesday this year. We will come together as a community for unlimited Zoom programs from morning until evening. Please share all of the materials with your friends and family in the community. It's a going to be a very exciting day and we need you to help us get the word out about the incredible work that our Federation is doing. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you in person um, and much closer soon. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you to our donors on this program who should be proud to know that your dollars are making a difference to those who need assistance and who are turning to our Federation. Before we start our program, a few Zoom housekeeping items. You are all on mute. The program is being recorded and there will be time for just a few Q&A at the end of Dr. Watson's presentation. If you want to ask a question, please use the virtual hand raise located by your name on the participants icon and we will unmute you. You can also email your questions to julianw at bocafed.org and we will forward them. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Robert Watson, a frequent lecturer at various events sponsored by the Jewish Federation of South Palm Beach County. He is, as you all know, a historian, award-winning author, professor, political commentator, community leader, musician, and just all about rock star. He has delivered over 2,000 lectures, has led study tours to historical sites around the country and internationally. 
please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Watson. Okay, thank you, Felice. Everybody can hear me okay? All right, I'm gonna set up a share screen option here because I put together some images for everybody and that should be loading right now and I'll scroll around so you can all see it uh, well. So first off, I wanna thank uh, Felice and Julianne and Aaron and Erica and, 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 and Deborah and everybody with the Federation for organizing uh, this. As you all know, I have a long history uh, with the Federation, so I'm, I'm familiar with the wonderful and important work being done. And I always, uh, honestly, I feel very honored every time I get to offer a program or lend my support. So I'm, I'm honored to do it today. Um, I've been saying since the start of this uh, crisis that I don't like the term social distancing. I think we should be calling it physical distancing uh, because today more than ever, we need to socially support one another and be connected. So in some small way, uh, Felice and everyone, I think this is allowing us to maintain that connection that's so important. And uh, I guess the proof is in the pudding. So many of you logged on, surely it has nothing to do with me. It has more to do with the fact that you're looking for something to do and I appreciate the fact that all of you have changed out of your morning pajamas into your afternoon pajamas <laughs> before we all changed our evening pajamas and cleaned the kitchen for the third time and watch yet another episode of a rerun of Friends, right? Uh, boy, this is a difficult and challenging time. So um, what I wanted to do today is something a little different. I wanted to avoid a politics or anything real heavy. Um, and I thought I'd, I'd be all nerded out so today is about uh, hidden history. So I know all of you have been asking, what is it that historians do? What do I do all day? What do historians do? How do we unravel the mysteries from history? What do we get right? What do we get wrong? Uh, what don't we know still? Um, if you're all like me, you love history and, and you, you logged on, zoomed on today, but you hated your history classes. I couldn't stand my history books when I took it in school because the professors and the textbooks would take all the people out of history. It was teaching history without the drama, the loves, the losses, the triumphs, the tragedies, the scandals, all the things that make it exciting. So, um, uh, but, so how do we do what we do? So um, I'll start off by uh, giving you a couple of examples. Then at the end, you're gonna get your master's degree in history today. I'm gonna to give you a little uh, list of uh, some of the things that we do and, and don't do. Um, so as we jump into this idea of how do we know what we know and how do we make sense of things, um, there's simply more we don't know than we do know. And with history, much of it is guesswork. For example, I've written several books set in the 1700s and 1800s. So that means I've read hundreds of diaries from that, those two centuries, hundreds of military reports, hundreds of personal letters, hundreds of newspaper stories. And I've had kind of a rule of thumb that I think one out of every three men in the 17 and 1800s was a full blown drunk. So, I mean, face down. Uh, why? Because that, it constantly pops up in everything you read. Now we didn't have an Alcoholics Anonymous back then you didn't have social scientists doing studies of it. People didn't write about it because it was just like breathing. People drank and drank and drank their woes away. Uh, imagine the miserable short lives that most people led uh, at the time. Yeah, hell, a toothache. Uh, it's not like you can just swing down to the dentist's office. They drank. Uh, so that's one thing from history that, uh, you know, we don't really talk about, but that's an interesting tidbit. Another one, uh, most people marry on the first Saturday in May or June, across lots of cultures and across much of the world. Why is it that we don't have many weddings on a Tuesday in November <laughs> or uh, you know, a Sunday in, in January? Uh, most of them are in, this come, most of them are the first Saturday in May or June. Why? This comes from medieval times. The first Saturday in May, most towns would open up the public bath. So people who had not bathed in a year <laughs> or in months would get their public bath on the first Saturday in May. So what you did is you quick got married right after the bath so that you could, I guess, propagate the species. Um, and if the weather was bad, the first Saturday in May, they would open it up the first Saturday in June. 
So people waited to get married and waited for all sorts of holidays and get togethers, parades, customs, ceremonies, until you got your annual bath. So you don't wanna know. Um, I always tell my students that if you could take a time machine and go back in history, the first thing you would recognize is the smell. Even worse than during the corona crisis when bathing is optional, right? <laughs> and we're running out of underarm deodorant. So the smell would have been horrendous. Equally, the custom of shaking with your right hand. Why is it that people shake with their right hand? So much from history we just take for granted without digging deeper and wondering. Well, the, the, the origins are, are multiple. One, armies were, were taught to fight with their right hand. Even if you're a lefty, you had to swing a sword or throw the spear with your right hand. The left hand was for your shield. Why? Because you wanted to protect your heart, uh, the most vital organ with your, uh, with your shield. So you fought with your right hand, used the shield for your left, and armies fought lockstep. Now, therefore, if you met someone uh, on a road uh, and you wanted to show that there was no sign of, of, of aggression from you, you would hold out your right hand. That means you didn't have a spear, a sword, a dagger or something. So you'd always hold out your right hand, but you didn't really trust this new person. So you still kept your left hand to guard your heart. So eventually that turned into the right hand handshake. And uh, after we developed the right hand handshake, uh, in a day and age before Purell and disinfectants, which we're all trying to stockpile today, by the way, don't ingest any disinfectants, just a, a tip for you. Uh, so in a day and age, before disinfectants, Purell, hand sanitizers, lots of soap, people designated their right hand for certain functions, your left hand for other functions. Your right hand was for meeting people, grooming, uh, eating, writing, even if you're a lefty. Your left hand would be for digging in the field and cleaning your bottom after you went to the bathroom. So when you would meet someone, like a curtsy, when you curtsy, your left hand goes behind your back because you wanted to hide your filthy, disgusting left hand and offer your right hand for obvious reasons. So there's all these little things from history that we don't really look at. So let's start off um, with history's mysteries and hidden history. A lot of you have heard me give a lecture on my book, The Nazi Titanic, which is an unknown shocking story about the final days of the Holocaust. So just to give you a sense that there's still history out there we don't know, here's a quick story for you a clue in classified documents, if you can see my, see my uh, image up here, I put on them. And that's a ship sinking and on fire. So I wanted, years ago, I wanted to write a book about World War II. Why? Because I'm an historian. I wanted to write a book about the Holocaust, about World War II, the Civil War, the Revolution, Lincoln, Washington, all the important topics. Um, so my problem was, what is there left to write about, about World War II? It seems like we've covered everything, right? So I, I came up with, here's the one thing that we're still missing from World War II, the last week of the war in Europe. Now the Nazis were very meticulous in the record keeping, but in the last week of the war, thank goodness, they were too busy dying, committing suicide or getting arrested. Uh, the British were also meticulous record keepers, but they were too busy along with the Red Army from the East and the Americans, the Canadians all rushing toward Berlin. So that last week was chaotic and we really don't have reliable records and everything was happening so quickly. That's the one part of World War II, we don't know what really happened. So I thought that's it. I'm gonna find something new. I'm gonna write a book on the last week of the war in Europe. I was gonna start on April 30th and go a week or so until the war ended with VE Day. Why April 30th? That's the day Hitler committed suicide. He took a cyanide pill, shot himself in the head, had his body buried in the Reichsgarden, the trifecta, the hat trick, good riddance. So I was going to start there and go about a week or so. What I wanted to do was every uh, uh, day, I wanted to take each day and find one story of love and one story of loss and tell that in a powerful and poignant way. This is the end of World War II, right, everyone? 60 plus million people around the world dead, the world's worst war, and of course the worst, world's worst instance of genocide. So uh, I want to tell a story of love and loss. Maybe against all odds, a couple was in two different concentration camps and maybe they lived and were reunited. 
Maybe a baby was born at that last day. Who was the last soldier to die in the war? This I thought would be powerful enough to, to give this topic justice. So I'm looking for each day, I'm looking for a story of love and loss. And I find a letter from a major in the British Army. His name was Till, T-I-L-L. -L. And Major Till writes that of all the horrors of World War II, the one that I'll never forget was when thousands and thousands of concentration camp survivors were all killed as we were signing the surrender. And I thought, what the heck? I've never heard of that. So I'm a big advocate for going to the source. So I called the Holocaust Museum in Washington. I called the World War II Museum in New Orleans. And I said, what is this guy talking about? How did thousands and thousands of Holocaust survivors all die when we were signing the surrender? I've never learned that. And they, they all said, it never happened. It's baloney. Must be a prank letter or whatever. So I'm thinking, all right, this letter seemed legitimate to me. And if you, by the way, if you want the oil changed in your car, don't call me. I have no idea how to do it. But if you want to know what a really, really old letter says, I'm your guy, okay? <laughs> so I'm your lifeline in trivial pursuits and I'm not worth a damn thing beyond that. So I know my old letters and I said, this seemed to be legitimate. So I put Major Till's letter aside and went back looking for stories of love and loss. I find a second letter by dumb luck. It was from a general named Mills Roberts. He was the general that was in charge of the British that liberated Northern Germany, the Southern Baltic. He writes in his letter, I was there and I watched thousands and thousands of Holocaust survivors all die in the most gruesome way. And this is a, a special forces general with a lifetime in uniform. He said, I've never seen anything quite like it. So now I had two letters. So I went back and contacted everybody and said, what the heck are these guys talking about? And everyone said it didn't happen. We have no record. So what I did was, as you well know, if you're trying to find out a loved one who was in World War I, a dad, an uncle, a grandpa, whatever, that was in World War II, I meant, uh, you can find out what unit they're in and track their unit through the war. So I got Major Till's unit and I got General Mills Roberts's unit, which was the sixth commando. And I followed them through the war, every battle they fought. And I, when I get to the very last hours of the war, Major Till's record disappears. His entire unit disappears. So I go through Mills Roberts and I find that the general's unit, everything disappears the last hours of the war. Now either A, that's one hell of a coincidence, or B, aliens abducted them. And since, you know, this isn't the History Channel, you know, which is Bigfoot and aliens, I don't accept that. So the third C, the only possible answer was what? It's all been classified. So I started digging to try to find the classified documents and my search took me to London, to the Royal Archives, which is like our National Archives, if anybody's been to the National Archives in Washington. And you know they have millions of documents. So I contact them and I say, listen, I think you're sitting on one of the biggest stories in history, click, <laughs> they hung up on me. So I call them back. And I say, don't hang up. I'm not a crazy man. I said, I think you're sitting on one of the biggest stories of World War II and the Holocaust. Click. <laughs> you know? So I'm calling them. I'm writing them. I'm emailing them. I'm sending old fashioned letters saying, listen, I really think there's this big story. And I think the answer is in your archives. And this is what I think it is. And this is where I think it is. You know, having spent three decades doing this now, uh, you know, it's the smell test. You know, you get a sense of what's real, not in history. I said, listen, I've read thousands of letters. I know this is the real deal. And they said, no, we don't have anything like that. I was so desperate. I was contemplating like Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible. I was going to dress in all black like a ninja and float down from the ceiling into the British archives. But since I weigh about twice as much as Tom Cruise, I think the rope would have broken. Plus, my son was applying for college at the time. And I didn't think that would look good on his application if his dad was arrested for breaking into the Royal Archives. So I'm in, um, I'm in France. This is six years ago. And I'm, um, I'm speaking uh, about the 70th anniversary of D-Day at the Normandy beaches. And I meet a woman there who's an amazing woman, a young woman that is my age, that is to say a very, very youthful late 50s. <laughs> Her name is Deborah Oppenheimer, and she's an Academy Award-winning filmmaker from Hollywood. 
and I meet her on the beach and I'm going, oh my gosh, uh, tell me about your work. She's buddies with Morgan Freeman. She's on the board of the U.S. Holocaust Museum. She's worked with Dame Judi Dench, who is about the best. She knows Maggie Smith. She's buddies with Maggie Smith, who's the greatest actor of our time. And I'm going, wow, this is so cool. Uh, tell me some stories. So I said, why don't we have a dinner tonight? Uh, and I'm on this, you know, riverboat. And she said, I'm on it too. And I go, wow, well, why don't we have dinner? Uh, do you mind my wife and kids are along? She goes, no, I don't mind. My parents are along. So I go, that's cool. In walks her parents. It's Eric and Gloria Oppenheimer. Uh, the mother was a kinder transport survivor. The father was a Holocaust survivor. And uh, here, Eric and Gloria were going to my lectures probably every week or two for the last 15 years. So I look at them and say, Eric and Gloria, what the hell are you doing here? And they go, this is our daughter. And I'm like, oh my God, she's your daughter? She won the Academy Award? I've known you for 15 years. Why didn't you tell me? What kind of Jewish mother are you? <laughs> that you didn't tell me that your daughter won the Academy Award. So, um, uh, so Debbie looks at me and she goes, you're the guy that they listen to all the time? So I said, yeah. And she goes, tell me about one of your books. So I tell her, I, I found this secret from this letter from Till and Mills Roberts. And I think that thousands of Holocaust survivors were all killed in this horrific accident at the very last minutes of the war. I said, and I need, I, I, I can't get anybody to talk to me. So she goes, oh, no worries. I know Prince Charles. I know the head of the Royal Archives. I know Maggie Smith and, and Sir Attenborough. I'll make a phone call. So I'm thinking she had way too much French wine. <laughs> so uh, she makes a call two days later. I check my email and the head of the Royal Archives and the head of the Imperial War Museum contact me and they say, Debbie called <laughs> and they say, what can we do for you? So I told them about what I found and I said, there's this amazing story and I think it has a horrific ending. And they said, we'll put our archivist, archivist on it and find it. Get this, two days later, I checked my email. They emailed me and said, Eureka, we found it. They found a box with hundreds of classified documents, letters, papers, all about this incident that you're looking at on the screen. And what happened, and as you, those of you that heard my lecture know, the Germans had built a replica of the Titanic. Hitler called it the Nazi Titanic. And after Hitler committed suicide and Goebbels committed suicide and everybody, what they didn't want was a lot of Holocaust survivors to fall into the hands of the allies. So as you know, the winter and spring of 45 was one of the most gruesome periods in world history because that's when Hitler issued his liquidation decree to just slaughter uh, thousands of, of concentration camp survivors. And we still don't know how many were lost in that period. But Heinrich Himmler, he wants thousands to be put on a ship in the Baltic Sea. And he picks the Nazi Titanic and he loads it up with thousands of Holocaust survivors. He wants to get on the ship, sail it to England and make a negotiation. I will give you thousands of Holocaust survivors in exchange for my life. But he gets caught right before this and commits suicide. Hermann Goring, everybody commits suicide. The ship is sitting there filled with thousands of people. And in the end analysis, the Nazis say, let's blow the ship up and scuttle it and take everyone to the bottom of the Baltic. That way the world will forget about the Titanic and remember the Nazi Titanic. That way we will deny the world from getting the Fuhrer's favorite ship, the Nazi Titanic, and it'll be one final F you to the world. Right when the Nazis were ready to do this, by mistake, the world's worst instance of friendly fire, the British flew six squadrons of bombers over the, the, the Baltic and blew the ship out of the water. Now, how could this story be out there for 70 years without being told? It's because the British and allies were so embarrassed that they classified all the documents top secret. And that was the file that they declassified for me and we got to look at all these documents. Here's a picture of the ship. Doesn't it look like the Titanic, everyone? Yeah, it had the same, you know, um, seven course dinners, a full orchestra, the grand chandeliers. The only difference is this ship has three funnels. The Titanic had four. Um, so that's the kind of, and I'm going to do a shameless plug. There's my book. Okay, enough shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, I thought that'd be funny. Okay, so how do we unravel history secrets and mysteries? Um, 
I got a couple of examples for you. We'll start with this guy. This is Daniel Borston, if you can all see him. Daniel Borston was the librarian of Congress and a great historian. I was a big fan of his. He had something, doesn't he look like a professor, by the way? I think that's what professors are supposed to look like. So I need to work on the glasses, bow tie, and okay. So um, at any rate, um, he had something called the law of survival of the unread. Uh, so here's what, what it says, two things. Basically, 99% of every book ever written is gone. Decomposed, burned, lost, destroyed on purpose, which is a whole nother story. Think about it. Books and paper today are chemically refined, highly processed. But if you take a piece of paper and sit it outside for a couple of months, it's soil. Imagine books back then, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. You're talking about scrolls and pamphlets and parchment. So all this stuff was gone. Before Ben Franklin's lightning rod, most houses would sooner or later catch on fire, right? Uh, before is in is Franklin stove. Um, so papers were burned. We've lost this. If that what that means is if 99% of every book ever written is gone, that means we probably know about what 1% of history. The other thing of the law of survival, of the unread, Borston said the books that everybody read are the ones that were destroyed because we touched them with you know the oils on our hands and bacteria in our hands. It was the books that no one read that survived because they sat on a shelf in a castle for a couple hundred years. So all the good books that we read are gone. Um, now, here's my corollary to Borst, and I don't mean to put myself on this level, not at all, but my corollary to Borston's Law of the Unread, I've been arguing, is the problem is not only are 99% of all the books gone, but 99% of all the things that make us human, the love letters, the poems, the recipes, the musical scores, the games children played, all that's gone, which is why when you read history books, it's just rote memorization of just dates and kings and wars without all the humanity inserted into it. So that's our, our big challenge. So in a way, history is a lot like paleontology. And I apologize for being nerded out about this, but history is a lot like paleontology. What's paleontology? It's the study of ancient life. So a paleontologist will study T-Rex, the way a historian will study the Revolutionary War. So if you're studying T-Rex, here's your challenge. You have to bring T-Rex to life. And there hasn't been a T-Rex walking this earth for the last 65 million years. And the problem is all the soft parts, the smell, the color, the sound, uh, the eyes. You know, we don't know what T-Rex sounded like because the, you know, the esophagus, the soft tissues have all decomposed. We don't know what color T-Rex was. Was it striped? Was it spotted? Did it have feathers? Was it green or brown like an alligator or something? You know, we don't know because that's a soft tissue. So the problem for the paleontologist is everything disappeared 65 million years ago and all that's left are the hard parts. Uh, a tooth, a claw, and a dried footprint in the Cretaceous mud. So how, good luck figuring out how T-Rex slept, hunted, you know, and mated based on a, a tooth and a claw and a footprint. But it's the same thing for historians. If we want to figure out what happened a couple hundred years ago, or even 200 years ago, all the soft stuff is gone. The love letters, the poems, the music. Uh, here's what we have left. A castle, a cannon, and a crown. That's why history books are just filled with castles, cannons, and crowns. We take the humanity out of history. Make sense, everyone? So that's our challenge. Now that you're all super excited, <laughs> let's figure it out. Okay, surviving letters. Here's what we do have. We have thousands and thousands of surviving letters. At the outset, I told all of you that I've read, I can't even add them up, how many letters from the founding fathers and so forth and so on. I always read a few hundred for every book I write. So surviving letters, that's reliable, or are they? Uh, so for example, two of the most important people in American history are George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. And fortunately for us, they were prolific writers. Washington wrote thousands of letters. Jefferson wrote thousands of letters. And if you want to know anything about the revolution, I wrote a book about the Revolutionary War, and I just finished a book about George Washington. It's supposed to be released on April 1, but the publisher is holding off until after the 
COVID crisis. So I don't know when that is, fall, winter, we'll see. So at any rate, if you wanna know about the revolution, read George's letters. He had a front row seat, right everyone? Here's the problem. We know that George wrote thousands of letters. And when he died on December 14, 1799, there were thousands of letters left. However, Mrs. Washington, Martha, lived until May of 1802. And when Mrs. W died, there were only hundreds of letters left, which means what? We believe that Martha burned the letters. She was very private. She wanted to capture some privacy. Um, and it was very common to burn love letters uh, after your loved one died. This was very common at the time. So here's our question. You ready, historians? Did Martha A randomly just burn hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of letters? Or B, did she systematically burn them? My money is on B, that she systematically burned them. So I imagine Martha sitting in front of a fireplace in Mount Vernon with her bonnet, didn't she look like Betty Crocker? <laughs> and her shawl, sitting on a cold winter's morn, reading these letters of George. And if she read a letter that said, my wife is my worthy partner, my anchor, my companion, which is what he wrote. I, get, I bet Martha said, you know, that's a keeper. <laughs> We're going to put that in this uh, little shoebox. That's a keeper. But if Martha read another letter that George wrote saying, my young hot neighbor, Sally Carey Fairfax, man, when she's out doing the gardening, woo! <laughs> I bet Martha said what? That's a burner. And she probably threw that letter in the fireplace, right? The answer is, we don't know. We don't know. We just know that she got rid of a lot of letters. My guess is she kept the best ones and got rid of the worst ones. So we don't know. So what I do when I'm writing on George is that he and I are on a first name basis. So um, when I'm writing on George, I'll contact the people at Mount Vernon and say, hey, I found one of George's letters. Do uh, you think this is indicative of yada, yada, yada? And they'll go, we don't know. What do you think? And I'll go, I don't know. Here's the second thing about George. George was a phonetic speller, which meant that he would have spelled phonetic with an F. <laughs> so he was a poor speller and he had a, a temper. So George writes all these, he was uneducated, poorly read, poorly traveled, and a phonetic spell with a temper. So George writes all these letters probably misspelled, angry, looking like a fool. When he wins the Revolutionary War, he realizes he becomes the most important man in the country. He did something no one else would do. He knows that one day we're going to be reading his letters, and he thinks, oh my God, all those letters I put out there. I always tell this to my college students, stop filming yourself drinking and doing stupid things on social media, because one day you're going to be our age and your kids are going to say, hey, mom, <laughs> what was up with that video clip on YouTube, right? Um, or employers are going to look at it. So fortunately, you and I, we didn't have social media, so we didn't do anything stupid. At least we didn't document anything stupid when we were 19. But George wrote a lot of dumb letters. Now, here's what he did. When he realized that everybody's going to be reading his letters, he sent um, uh, a guy named Tobias Lear, who was a Harvard-educated aide, and Alexander Hamilton. He sent them around to collect all the letters he wrote. So they would go around to generals, officers, George's neighbors, members of the Continental Congress, and knock on the door and say, the general wants his letters back. Well, because it's George, you give the letters back. Then they would take them back to Mount Vernon. They would edit them and rewrite them and re-deliver them. So here's our challenge. You ready? Which letters are the real ones and which ones are 2.0? So when I get a George letter, I call Mount Vernon and say, is this the real one or is this the one they edited? And guess what they say to me? We don't know. What do you think? And guess what I say to them? I don't know. So what do we know? We don't know. Thomas Jefferson. He wrote thousands of letters. You see the image at the top of the screen here? That's our first copy machine. You've all been to Monticello, and you see it sitting there on a, like a draftsman's table at a 45 degree angle. Can you see that there's two pieces of paper with two quills put on it? And you see there's a pulley system connecting it? When Jefferson would write something down, the other pen would write the same thing down. So whenever he wrote one letter, he would have a copy, so he had a document for everything that he wrote. So why? Because he has a good record keeping. He was also a megalomaniac. <laughs> uh, 
and he didn't trust whomever it was he sent the letters to to preserve his genius. Jefferson was worried about what we're going to think about him in another two hours. I'm trying to think what my next point is going to be in this lecture. So what Jefferson would do is he would keep a copy of all these letters. Now, here's the problem. He wanted us to read his brilliance. And here's what we know about Jefferson. He oftentimes changed the date on his letters. So he was president from 1801 to 1809, our third president. Let's say in 1802, he tells his Secretary of State, James Madison, to do something that works out really well. Jefferson wants us to know that he was brilliant. So what he does is after it worked out well, he'll write a letter, but he'll write it in past tense. He'll write it saying, or future tense rather, he'll write it saying, if only Madison would do this, I think it would work out well and help the country. And then he'll date it a year or two earlier. So when we get Jefferson's letters, we say, my God, this guy even knew the lottery numbers. This is brilliant. So um, why? Because he wrote the wrong date on it. So when I'm writing about Jefferson and I find one of his letters, what do I do? I call the people at Monticello and I say, is this the real letter or is this the one he changed the date on? And guess what they say to me? You're right. We don't know. What do you think? And what do I say? I have no idea. So even letters are not necessarily reliable. Here's one for you. The curious case of Sarah Polk. Now you know I'm really getting boring. Sarah Polk, she was the wife of uh, President James K. Polk in the 1840s. Here's what's neat about her. She was Eleanor Roosevelt 100 years before Eleanor Roosevelt, and yet we didn't know much about it. So I was working on Polk, oh, this must be 20 years ago. Um, and um, I, I, Polk was in his 40s when he was president. He was a decent president. He was the president during the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which got the United States the whole Southwest. He won the Mexican War, which today we call the Mexican-American War, even if I was against it. Um, so Polk's an interesting guy. Um, so I thought, well, let's learn more about Polk. When I'm reading about Polk, I realize I'm reading about the wrong Polk. So for example, I, Sarah Polk was Eleanor Roosevelt. I found all these old newspapers uh, stories and letters from, let's say, senators' wives, and here's what they would do when there would be a grand gala at the White House or wherever, they would announce the Polks as follows. They would say, ladies and gentlemen, the president and Mr. Polk. It's pretty good for the 1840s. So Sarah Polk was quite something else. Uh, everybody would say, we know that Mrs. Polk is a master of herself and we all suspect of someone else too. So here's what I did. Um, I started looking at Polk's letters in the Library of Congress and it, at, uh, in, in Tennessee, in the archives, state archives. And what you find is Polk's speeches um, have all this scribble in the margins. You know, when you read an historical speech or a letter, you don't want to read just the final copy. So for example, FDR says December 7th, 1941, a date that will live in the speech said history, that will live in history. That's what it was written. He gets up there in front of the microphone and says what? that will live in infamy. He adds that word. That's a hell of an upgrade. That's Shakespearean. Harry Truman on May 14th, 1948, when he recognizes Israel at 6.11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, by the way, Harry Truman, his speech in front of him, it says, quote unquote, the United States government hereby recognizes the de facto Jewish state, end quote. Truman crosses it out on the speech and writes in big letters over it, Israel. So that's a nice upgrade, right, everyone? So I'm reading all this Polk speeches, and in the margins, here's what I find. All the scribble says, pause here for effect. See the article I cut out for you. Senator so-and-so will vote against this. And I'm thinking, wow, Polk speech writer is pretty impressive. So I match the handwriting. Guess who it was? You're right, Mrs. P. It was Mrs. Polk. She was amazing. So I start digging around, and I find all these letters of the ladies of Washington, no one liked her. I like her. I think she's Eleanor Roosevelt. So I'm thinking, why do, why do ladies not like her? Here's why. It was customary back then, if the president had an event, uh, if the first lady was not presiding, or even a presiding woman at an event, a, a wife couldn't go along. So if a man threw a party and his wife wasn't presiding, it was only for guys. Sarah Polk wouldn't preside over the parties. She was too busy lobbying and doing politics. So the women felt snubbed. 
Also, after Polk's parties, all the men would adjourn for bourbon and cigars to solve the world's problems. The ladies would go have tea and scones in the green room or the yellow room. I'll let you guess which room Mrs. Polk went to. You're right, with the guys. So the ladies felt that they were snubbed by her. So Mrs. Polk was Eleanor Roosevelt, and we can't just take uh, you know, this letter that says nobody likes Mrs. Polk, we have to dig deeper and find out why the ladies didn't like her. They were jealous of her. So there she is, looking pretty drab, by the way. Um, battlefield reports from the War of 1812. So I wrote a book on the War of 1812, and there, it, you know, it never, nobody knows about the War of 1812, and it never makes our textbooks. Why? Because we started the war, we didn't win, and we conducted ourselves like Vikings killing civilians. It was an embarrassment. So Harry Truman called it, quote unquote, the silliest damn war we ever fought. But here's why it was exciting for me. This is exciting stuff that historians do, Felice. <laughs> there are some battles in the uh, War of 1812, we still don't know who won. So I found the battlefield letters from one of the generals, let's say an American general. And he said, we killed 500 British and only lost 100 men. It was a great and glorious victory. And I went, oh my gosh, I just found out who won this battle. This is going to be the teaspoon of knowledge I pour into the ocean of history. This is exciting. So I'm, I'm calling all my nerdy history professor friends saying, I found out who won the battle. So I keep digging around. Guess what? I found out the British, I find the British general's battle report. Guess what he said? Same damn thing on the opposite. I, we killed 500 Americans and only lost 100 men. It was a great and glorious victory. They're both claiming they killed more of the enemy and they both won. So who's telling the truth? Here's my guess, neither one of them. I think they're both fibbing. Imagine you're a British general in rural Canada in the early 1800s. Your soldiers are drunk or illiterate. And if they are literate, nobody has paper to write down on. You screw up the battle and lose the battle. Why write a report saying you blew it and lost the battle? and give it to a man who gets on a horse and without GPS, travels through hundreds of miles of wilderness. Maybe he's eaten by a bear, like in the Revenant. Maybe he's killed by Indians. Maybe he gets lost. He makes it to the St. Lawrence River, gets on a rickety old boat, which goes to Halifax. A month later, he boards a ship and crosses the Atlantic. If it makes it, he delivers a report from you, the general, General Deborah, saying, I blew the battle and lost the war. And then they send a letter back that may or may not arrive in six months saying you're fired. Why not fib and say you won the battle and did a great job? I think this is what generals throughout history said. And I'm not sure how accurate virtually any battle report is throughout history. So we have to question all this. Isn't that exciting? Okay. All right. Here's a good one for you. Now we'll get a little more exciting. Here's Harry. Uh, as you know, presidents have their vacation uh, and they're working, all presidents except one, do working vacations. And uh, most of them go to Camp David, which used to be Shangri-La. Uh, Ike changed the name because of his grandson, David. Um, Truman didn't use Camp David much. Truman went to Key West, to the Little White House, okay? And you've all been there, right? Um, he spent 175 days there during his presidency, 11 official visits, and then went back five more visits after his presidency. And he had his staff down there. He worked there. He typically wore Hawaiian shirts. Here he is in a pith helmet. Loved going to the beach. He worked hard, but played hard. So 20 years ago, I'm moving to Florida. The Truman Library is getting a new director, Mike Devine. The Truman Home in Key West is getting a new director, Bob Walls. The Truman Foundation is getting a new director, Kathy Knotts. All that. The Truman, uh, 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 what is it, the board is getting a new director, Clifton, the grandson. So I contact everybody and say, why don't we all work together? I'm moving to Florida. The Key West home is a treasure, but it's a dump. Let's go down and renovate it and make it look the way it looked when Truman was there. We'll redo the carpet, the wallpaper. We'll bring furnishings back in and all that. So what I did is I raised 40,000. Well, we had to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars, but I initially raised $40,000 to fly all the living advisors to Harry Truman down to the building. Here's our problem. The only photographs left of the building were in black and white, so we didn't know the color of the carpeting or the wallpaper. And the photos only showed us one or two rooms. We didn't know what the other rooms looked like. We didn't know where Truman put his briefcase, his desk, 
his table where he gambled and drank bourbon and scotch, the important things. We didn't know any of this. So I brought all these guys down there. The other problem was the company that provided all the furnishings went out of business in the 50s. So we don't know what was there. So we had all these men, they remembered where everything was in the colors and then we put it in there. So here's what we did. Um, the director of the Truman Home called me one day and said, my God, I found a box filled with reports every two hours for 175 days documenting everything Truman did. Now, that may sound boring and nerdy, but that's really important for history. So we know what the president was doing all this time in Key West. So I said, let me see the papers in the box and I'll get my graduate students and we'll type them up. It was one hurricane away from being lost because it sat in the, in the attic at Key West for 50, 60 years. So I said, we'll type it up and we'll digitize it, send it to the National Archives and we can have this great report. So here's what I found. What I found was in the morning, at eight in the morning, late at night, in the middle of the day, throughout the day, Truman would always say this line. You see that line there? Okay, boys, it's time to get some work done. What he would do is he would announce to his staff that it's time to get work done because Truman was a workaholic. So when I had all these Truman advisors gathered together, all these living guys in the Truman home, at the end of the, our, our long ep, uh, you know, weekend and week of work, I said, I have a surprise for you. We found, uh, this, the director, Bob, found this box. And they go, wow. And I said, here's what it is. There was a young naval officer that was assigned to Truman. And he wrote down everything Harry did. And the age is sitting around going, yeah, I remember that guy. And I said, would you like to hear what it said? And they go, of course. And I said, Truman worked his butt off. And they all go, mm, not really. And I go, yeah. Every two, three hours, he writes, okay, boys, it's time to get some work done. Look here, and I'm showing them all the pages. And they're sitting around, and one of the most senior Truman advisors, uh, he was, he and Clark Clifford were the two point people on Statehood for Israel, by the way. His name was George Elsie. He wrote the first draft of the Truman Doctrine. Elsie's this amazing, was, was this amazing man. He looks at me and he goes, what was that quote again? And I said, the young naval aide wrote, okay, boys, time to get some work done. Elsie starts busting up laughing. He goes, no, no, no. Here's what it was. Truman, every two hours, would say, okay, boys, it's time to get some drunk done. Time to cheat and gamble the cards. Time to put some scotch down. And the naval aide said, Mr. President, I can't write that the President of the United States is drinking like a fish at eight in the morning or cheating at cards. And Truman said, a typical Truman, of course, write it down. So what? The aide said, I can't write that the President's drinking and cheating at cards. Truman said, it's what I'm doing, so write it down. The aide says, Mr. President, Truman says, well, then write whatever you want. So whenever Truman wrote, okay, boys, it's time to get some work done, what he actually said was, okay, boys, it's time to get drunk or time to play some cards. So that, that's what the aide wrote down. Ah, uh, what else do we have? Here's a good one. Oh, boy, there we go. That's Sally Carey Fairfax. She was probably the real love of George Washington's life. Uh, she was uh, his wealthy... Uh, flirtatious, sophisticated, well-read neighbor. She's the one that taught George to dance. Uh, she introduced him to literature, to the important art of social discourse. Uh, so she takes George under her wing and molds this raw, acne, big, poor teenager uh, into the man that we know. So during the French and Indian Wars, 1750s, 1760s, called the Seven Years' War in Europe, George is a hero out around Pittsburgh, near Fort Duquesne. It was called the Braddock Expedition. General Lord Braddock uh, leads a big army out to beat the French and Indians, and he gets annihilated. Every officer's killed, Braddock's killed. It's, it's an, a grotesque embarrassment. So here's what happens. George Washington wanted to be a gentleman planter and an officer in the worst way. Problem was he didn't have money and he wasn't going anywhere. He had more defeats than victories, they're going to fire George Washington from his command. So the young George in his early 20s resigns before they can fire him. What happens is George has the hots for his neighbor, Sally. Sally's husband is a lot older than her. They would have been good in Boca today, wouldn't they? He was a little guy and she was this, you know, he was twice her age. So he's never around. So she uh, kind of flirts with George and George kind of flirts with her when he's young. So uh, Lord Fairfax is away. Sally hears that there's a great party in Williamsburg. 
because Lord Braddock, the general's coming over to lead the army to destroy the French and Indians. So she wants to go to the party. Problem, her husband's traveling in Europe. So she asked George to be her escort. So George is so excited. So George is her escort, gets all dressed up. He goes to the party and he's crushed because Sally just fawns for Lord Braddock. She loves the uniform, all the gold embroidery. He's sophisticated. He's everything George is not. George is out of uniform. So at the end of the party, Braddock announces he's taking recruits to lead this great army. So George enlists. George is an aide. Braddock gets killed. Everyone dies and all the officers die in this Braddock expedition. George, after Braddock is killed, George saves the army. This is when he becomes George. He mounts a horse and rides between the enemy and Braddock's army to rally an organized retreat. He has two horses shot out from under him. He has multiple bullet holes through his jacket. One of the aides, one of the colonial aides, his horse is shot out from under him. He's underneath the horse. An Indian is going to kill the guy. Because unlike in the movies, he can't lift the horse up. George jumps off the horse and with his bare hands kills the Indians, runs and jumps back on a horse. This is like a Clint Eastwood movie or something. So we have all these descriptions of George. George is the only one on a horse when they march the army back to Williamsburg. So he becomes a hero. So George writes a letter to a young woman named Martha Dandridge Custis. She would soon become Martha Washington. And he has to explain his suicidal bravery on the battlefield. Textbooks used to, years ago, always put this letter in there. You see the quote from the letter. Here's what George said to Martha, whom he wants to marry. Why? She's older than him and she's wealthy. Martha was one of those colonial cougars. Could you see her at Meisner Park in Boca today? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so George writes to Martha and says, here's explaining his suicidal bravery. He says, for if I died, it would matter not. For in your eyes, I would die a hero. I profess myself a votary to love. Wow, that's pretty poetic stuff. George is usually someone who didn't write with adverbs or adjectives. The day is hot. The army was good. I mean, George, George wrote the way Trump speaks, you know, like noun, verb, you know. Um, so why did he write this beautiful, I profess myself a votary to love? They no longer publish this letter in textbooks. I think they should. Here's why they stopped publishing it. George didn't write the letter to Martha. You knew that was coming. He wrote the letter to Sally there on the screen. Yikes, he was engaged to Martha. I think they should publish the letter, don't you? It shows another side of George. Makes him look human, doesn't it? Yep, so let's continue on here. You know that George never cut down a cherry tree, of course. That's just baloney. The letter, it comes from a Parson Mason Weems book. When George dies, Parson Weems was a preacher turned bookseller. He wants to sell a lot of books and make money, which is not a very, you know, clerical thing to do, I suppose. Um, so he has some historian write a book about George. It's this thick. Nobody can read it. There's no photos and it doesn't sell. So he writes his own version and makes it all up. And what he does is he puts the story in about the fourth or fifth edition of the cherry tree. Here you see the picture. When George was a little boy, his father, Augustine, gets him an ax. Now, if I got my son when he was a little kid an ax, the Department of <laughs> Family and Children would arrest me, right? What parent gives their little boy a hatchet? <laughs> so, but it was a different time. Uh, he had a cherry orchard. George goes and chops down one of the cherry trees. And Augustine finds him and says what? What does it say in the book? George, who killed my cherry tree? George said, it was I, father, for I cannot tell a lie. Now, does that sound like a little kid? No, it sounds like a pretentious little bastard to me. Uh, but George never said that. Parson Weems made the whole darn thing up. We need to read between the lines to figure it out. Of course, George didn't wear wooden teeth. They were hippopotamus ivory. Martha had a his and her matching hippopotamus ivory denture. Dentures, that's pretty sexy stuff, isn't it? <laughs> With horse's teeth and human teeth put in. George's death. George, that's Mount Vernon. George died on May 14th, seven, uh, December 14th, 1799. So years ago, I wanted to find out what, he, what was he doing the day of his death. So he had four farms and he had a supervisor at each farm, an overseer was what they called him. I went and read the overseer's report and he said, George in a snowstorm and horrible weather came out 
to see the farm at 3 a.m. Why would any older prosperous man be out in a snowstorm looking at his farm at 3 a.m.? There's only one reason to be out at that hour. They called it night walking. You would go out and have sex with the slaves. Now, slave owners all did this. George didn't. Slave owners did. But when I read this, I'm going, oh, my God. George was out at 3 a.m. Does that mean, you know, and say it isn't so. So I quick got the three other farm reports, and they all said 3 p.m. So the guy just wrote an A instead of a P. Imagine if we didn't have the other three reports, everyone, how that could have changed history. One letter. Um, my love is in the grave. I'll only do maybe two or three more of these, and we'll end it. My love is in the grave. That's James Buchanan there, who was our 15th president, 1857 to 61, a Democrat from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, and here's the story. Buchanan was single. Uh, he was single when he became president. He's the only president never to marry. Now, uh, there are rumors today that he was gay, and I think he was, and I'll give you the evidence in a moment. So Buchanan never married. Why didn't he marry? This is why. That's Ann Coleman. Uh, Ann Coleman was his fiance, and what happened was Ann and, and Buchanan were going to get married, but Ann's friends met with her, and they told her they caught Buchanan in some hanky panky and it wasn't with a woman so Anne breaks off the wedding she's so distraught she and her mother go to philadelphia from lancaster to meet with her sister and they they're going to go out to a play to cheer Anne up Anne said i'm too depressed to go to the play go the mother and sister go to the play they come back and they find Anne dead of an accidental overdose of laudanum it's an opiate and tea so they take Anne back and they bury her the day she was supposed to get married. She's wearing her wedding dress. Buchanan goes to the funeral. He breaks down crying and he says, my love is in the grave. I will never love again. I will never marry. And therefore throughout his life, the fact that he was never seen dancing with a woman, kissing a woman, dating a woman, never married. Nobody ever said anything because this touching story. What's the problem with the story? He made it up. It's all baloney. Here's what happened. He was hanky-panky with another man. Anne went to Philadelphia and killed herself. It wasn't accidental. When she was buried the day she was supposed to get married, Buchanan was on the run because Anne's father said, if I can find him, there'll be two funerals that day. So Buchanan was on the run. He made the whole story up to cover his sexuality. And so people wouldn't question him on this. So you have to read between the lines. Uh, Paul Revere's Midnight Ride, I'm going to skip this and get to an end. He never really made it to Concord. He made the whole thing up. Why? Dr. Joseph Warren and Dr. Samuel Prescott, the ones who did this and made it to Concord, they both died. So Paul Revere rewrote history to make himself the hero of it. And the other two were dead. Uh, surviving paintings, how reliable are they? We have letters, but we have paintings. The Boston Massacre. You've all seen this image, right, everyone? Speaking of Paul Revere, this is from his famous engraving. He was a silversmith. It shows the captain back there, Thomas Preston, ordering the British to fire on us. So we see it as a massacre. This isn't true. What happened was the Americans were a mob and were attacking. Preston ran between the British and the Americans and said, stop, don't fire. The Americans claimed he was yelling fire and they opened fire. So if we get the real version of this, it completely changes the notion. Here's Martha Washington. Doesn't she look like Betty Crocker? Doesn't she look like Mrs. Santa Claus or something? Ugh. So she, Martha hated to have her painting, which is apparent. Uh, now here's the thing. We have reports of Martha as a teenager that she was a young, attractive, spunky, thin woman. I think if we show this picture instead of this picture, we'd have a different version of Martha. She was courted by a man who showed up at her home on horseback and called for her and her father to come out front, and he didn't even dismount. Martha's so pissed as a 17-year-old, she marches up to him, says she wants to tell him something. When he leans over, pow, she pops him uh, and says it's off. Uh, so Martha was spunky. Martha's family's middle class. Um, there was her husband, um, Daniel Custis, he comes from the wealthiest plantation uh, in Virginia, he's 20 years or is her senior. He's 37, she's 17. 
how would a 17 year old girl from a middle class family marry into this wealthy wealthy? Because she was something else. What did George see in Martha? What we don't see in the images. So we need to show different pictures for Martha. Same with George. Look how gigantic he is. He's bigger than horses. He's bigger than battlefields. He's bigger than cannons. He's bigger than mountains. He's, he's like Captain Morgan riding across the Delaware River. He's even giant phallic symbols. George is even a video game. George was a Greek god. I mean, look at this. Um, so we know George was big. Here's the problem. George was a big guy. But if you look at some of the paintings of him and extrapolate from the paintings, he's 10 feet tall. Because he's the father of his country, we have to paint him bigger, don't we? Uh, so this raises the question. Think of all the kings, the paintings of kings you see. Do you really think they were as handsome as they looked in the painting? I don't think so. Um, the king's always leading the army at the front of the, you know, on horseback with abs. No, the king was back at the castle eating a turkey leg with his mistress. But the king tells his painter, paint me looking, you know, a lot taller. Give me better hair. Give me better muscles. Give me, yeah, sure. Uh, just like our glamour shots. Don't you with your glamour shots or on your Facebook page, don't you use that photo from 1985? <laughs> or the one with the wind in your hair? Yeah, we all do. Uh, uh, rather, than, well, not you guys don't need to do that as good looking as this audience is, what I'm seeing. Uh, no, I need to do it. Um, in fact, funny story. One of my publishers recently, uh, we have a photo that I got taken about 10 years ago they use in the back of the books, before glasses, before gray, before before all this. And uh, I, so I decided to get a new photo because that was 10 years old. I don't even look like that guy. So I sent my publicist my new photo and they said to me, they go, why don't we stay with the old one? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so I think, what do we really know about paintings? You know, Henry VIII was way worse looking than what, the way he's painted because um, the painter didn't want to be beheaded. Um, George is big, but he wasn't 10 feet tall. How big do we know George is? His doctor, Dr. Craig, did two medical reports of George that survived history. In one, he has George at 6'3", and the other one, he has George at 6'1". So for the 1770s, this is like being Shaquille O'Neal. So here's our problem. Here's my question to you. So let's say Erica is a uh, historian. How big is George? Here's what I said. At 163, 161, he's 6'2". You split the difference. Here's the second thing I wrote. Dr. Craig was a lousy physician, couldn't even measure his patient. So um, we're gonna end with this. Um, what is history? Um, too often, and here's where you get your master's degree in history, I'll mail your diploma out. Um, historians are prophets in reverse. We think we know about the past, but the future is uncertain. I would argue that the past is almost equally as uncertain because what history are we reading? What's really been recorded? What do we really know about the letters? Not much. Um, here's a couple quotes I always liked. Mencken, the satirist, legend is a lie that has attained the dignity of age. You know, you wait another enough years and people believe everything, don't they? Voltaire said, historians are gossips who tease the dead. Here's my favorite, it's an African proverb. Until the lions have their historians, tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunters. Doesn't the victor write the history? Yes. And here's what we say at the end of your graduate class before you get your diploma. All right, now that you're all getting your master's in history, here's what we need to do. In order to know history, we need to forget what we know and, and unlearn what we've learned. Didn't we learn that Paul Revere rode all the way to Lexington and Concord? Didn't we know that the Boston Massacre was the British lining up? Didn't we know that, yeah, it's wrong. We know George, didn't tell a lie and cut down a cherry tree, threw, threw the coin over the bridge uh, across the Delaware River. Uh, no, he didn't. Um, George, you know, it wouldn't teeth. No, he didn't. So uh, we have to unlearn. Secondly, the problem is historians have, have not uh, studied what they deem to be unworthy topics. Let me give you one, women's history. We know virtually nothing about women in the 16 and 1700s. If I'm getting my PhD at Harvard in history, and I go to my dissertation committee and say, I've got a hell of a topic for you. It's something that we've ignored. It's important. We're going to learn something new. And, and now they're all sitting on the end of the seat. What is it, Robert? I go, 
I'm going to write about child rearing in the 1700s. I'm going to write about recipes during the revolution. They're going to say what? No, you're not. You're going to write about the Constitution or Ben Franklin. We're going to ignore women's history. We still ignore women's history. Most historians were men, and therefore they ignored women's history. Um, the soft parts don't survive, only the castles, crowns, and cannons, as you see here. Most history is made by luck and chance. We think the general was brilliant by going to his left. You know why he went to his left? He doesn't know. He just went to his left. Maybe it looked like it was going to rain off to the right. And by going to his left, he won the battle. Had he gone to his right, he might have lost the battle, and all of history would be different. The other problem is the day-to-day -day rarely gets recorded. History is written by the victors and only the big parts. Um, I say the best way to know history is this. Human nature has not changed. We still do the same stuff. Heroism, foolishness, triumph, tragedy. Only the names change. So when we look back at history, I try to think of human nature and what people are doing today. And I'll end with one of my favorite stories. That's Ben Franklin. Silence do good. So Ben Franklin was raised in Boston by an uneducated candle maker and soap maker. 16 kids, he was the 15th, the oldest son, or the youngest son rather. So his family had nothing, which meant Ben Franklin was destined to a life of indentured servitude. His mother realizes early on that he's brilliant. So he wants him to be a preacher because at least that way he could get an education. If anybody knows anything about Ben Franklin, the idea of him as a preacher is laughable. Um, so Ben is apprenticed to his older brother, James, who has a newspaper. So when he's 10, 11, 12, 13, he's working for James's newspaper. The newspaper business was competitive then. Unlike today, every town had many, many newspapers. Boston had multiple, one of the most important cities in the country. Ben, as a kid, revolutionizes the printing industry as a kid. Now, James is so jealous of Ben, he, he, he can't stand his younger brother because he's smarter than him. And Ben is coming up with new ways of publishing as a 12-year-old. One day, the boys go out to the printing press in Boston. And they open up the doors to the printing press, and someone had slipped a letter under the door. This is how you submit letters to the editor. At night, you slip a letter, and everybody wrote under a pen name. And Ben gets the letter and reads it and says, oh, my God, this is good stuff. He gives it to his brother, James, and it's a story about a, a society widow named Silence Duguid. And she writes that her family left England when they were crossing the Atlantic Ocean, pirates attacked. They killed her family. The pirate captain took her as his mistress. She became a pirate and then fights and kills him and frees herself and makes it to America, marries into money, and now she's a society woman. What a story. Ben says to James, we have to publish this in the paper. James said, Puritanical Boston, we can't write this. Ben says, this is what people want. Write it. So they publish it. Guess what? It becomes the rage of Boston. It's all anybody's talking about. Everybody can't wait to buy the Franklin Brothers paper. A few days later, they go out and they open up the, the doors. There's another letter from Silence Do Good. Ben reads this one and goes, wow, this is even better. Gives it to James. Now what Silence Do Good is talking about is, which ladies are having affairs with which men in Boston? Which two ladies wore the same dress to the party? Who gained the most weight? You know, all that stuff. Isn't that what we want to read? You know, it's like Entertainment Tonight. It's an episode of the Kardashians. Uh, ben would have been a Kardashian, except he had talent. Um, so Ben says to James, you have to publish this letter. James says, my God, I can't do this. This is talking about sex. Ben says, this is what people want. Against his better judgment, James publishes the letter. What do you think happened? People can't get enough of it. It's the rage. So everybody's looking for Silence Do Good. So James needs to find out who Silence Do Good is, so he hides in the bushes all night outside the printing press. To his horror, little Ben shows up and slides the letter. Ben Franklin is writing under the pen name Silence Do Good. Now, here's the thing. How would an uneducated, untraveled little boy understand the social sophistication of a society woman. How would he do this? You know, I admit, I don't get it. My wife and I will go to a party and afterwards she'll say, oh, so-and-so doesn't like you. Couldn't you tell? And I'll go, nah, they love me. She goes, no, they don't. Or she'll say, someone really likes you. And I go, no, they don't. And she'll say, do you see the lady in that dress? And I'll go, which one? I miss everything, right? How could Ben, as a little boy, 
understand all the social sophistication and know who's sleeping with who and who's doing all this. Historians have two theories. Theory number one, Ben was a world's class eavesdropper. He would go to the market, pretend to be buying an apple and listen to the two ladies who are putting apples in their basket going, did you hear that lady so-and-so is sleeping with Colonel so-and-so? Did you see how much weight she gained? And, and he would pick up all the gossip. Here's the other theory. Ben was sleeping with all the older wealthy women as a little kid. I believe the answer C, all of the above. Why do I believe this? Ben wrote a great letter. A young boy was getting engaged and he wrote to the great Dr. Franklin, your last story. He says, I'm worried about my wedding because I'm inexperienced if you know what I mean. Ben wrote back and said, weddings are great things, but you need some experience for your wedding night. He said, might I recommend sleeping with older women? He said, the, the riper the fruit, the sweeter it is. <laughs> so Ben says, as a man of science, I've done considerable experimentation and you, you definitely want to sleep with older women. Then he made like a David Letterman top 10 list <laughs> on all the reasons. He put eight reasons on it. And he said, here's one of the reasons. He said, um, with older women, there's no hazard of them becoming pregnant. And if you're someone like me who gets around a lot, you can't have too many illegitimate kids. He did have at least one, we think a couple. Um, secondly, he said, plus, if she talks about it, who the hell's going to believe her? <laughs> I mean, he says, next, she might be so desperate that you're liable to get dinner out of it. And then he ends with this. This is cute. He says, um, in all my ex considerable experience, I found that men age from the bottom up, whereas women age from the top down. So with women, even if the face might be going, the vitals are still working just fine. And here's his advice. Ben says, in the dark of night, all cats are gray. Just blow the candle out and knock yourself out. Ben Franklin. So who would know? We should publish this letter, but we don't. So there's a little overview of of some of the tricks that historians use, some of what we know, what we don't know, and how we can't rely on a lot of letters unless if we dig and dig and dig and dig. Okay, if anyone's still awake, <laughs> I think that um, and take questions. I think Adam Slotnick has a question. We have room, time for like two questions, two or three questions. Adam, uh, thank you, everyone, for putting this call together. And uh, Dr. Watson, we're talking about what's missing in history. Seems like one of the things that we're missing today in society uh, is we're in this increasingly factless society, especially with social media and in the regular media as well. Have you seen in history in any other instances of misinformation? Yeah. And as far as moving forward, based on your research, uh, what we need to be the catalyst for change? Thank Good. You. That's a great question. The answer is tragically yes. Uh, the type of uh, the war on the truth today, alternative facts, fear being re replacing facts. This is not new in history. We've done this throughout history. How the, the uh, 1918 uh, influenza, uh, it was a misinformation campaign. Our leaders said, don't worry about it. It's not contagious. They, uh, they actually had, a, they didn't call it this, but they had a social distancing protocol during the influenza, San Francisco, many cities. Philadelphia was supposed to, but they, they wanted to have a parade and they said, go ahead out. And 7,000 people die in Philadelphia within a few days of the parade of the influenza. So we've always had this. Think of the KKK. Think of the Birch Society. Think of propaganda throughout history. Think of Nazi propaganda. Think of Joseph Goebbels' attack on the truth. Think of uh, Mussolini authorizing what we would today call alternative facts. Um, tragically, throughout history, the there's always been this war on facts. I think what makes it worse today is we have social media, we have countless channels on television, radio. So it's just a bigger chorus of lies and hate and misinformation. Whereas back then, maybe you have one or two sources. And I think um, part of the problem is with the social media. You know, my students on campus don't read the Wall Street Journal or watch NBC. They get their news from this from social media, you know, which is not fact checked, not spell, hell, it's not even spell checked. It's not peer reviewed, it's not refereed. Secondly, I think our young people today, uh, because of the way we teach standardized testing, like in Florida, 
we don't teach critical thinking, independent thinking. We don't teach them the question, the answer, instead of answering the question. So they're gullible. Our students today are ahistorical. If I ask them when the Civil War was, who'd we fight in the revolution? Why did we have World War I? They don't, they have no idea. They have no idea. So if you're ahistorical and you're not taught to think critically and you're getting your news from this, it, it, it's a perfect storm for all this. I even think this is part of the a recipe for the tragic resurgence of anti-Semitic violence and hate today. You know, every major organization, as you know and I know, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, Anti-Defamation League, have, et cetera, have all documented this unprecedented spike the last three, four years in anti-Semitic incidents across the country, across the world. Um, I think part of it is um, the, the spike in, 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 in social media and the fact that young people, college campuses are overrun by this, are not historical. I find that if, for example, if I walk into my class at the beginning of the semester and I say Treblinka, Dachau, you know, Auschwitz, uh, Theresienstadt, you know, if I start saying it, I would say at least 50% of the students have never even heard of the terms. Uh, and maybe only one quarter will raise their hand and go, we've heard of that, ouch, whatever that word is, we've heard of that. They don't even know. Um, so if they don't see the threats to Israel, an existential threat, if they don't know the lessons of history of the Holocaust, this is why they're so susceptible to the BDS movement, the Students for Justice in Palestine, and so forth on college campuses today. So I think, Adam, you've touched a larger issue here, uh, that this is not new in history, but my God, are we ahistorical today and we're competing with the social media, which is one of the most powerful social forces ever invented. And how do you compete with that? Uh, and the truth is the casualty of it. Okay, so we have one more question, um, Beth Becker, and then we're gonna wrap up and say thank you. So Beth, you're on and then that's it. Well, hi, this is, hi, this is Howard. Howard. Um, talk about mysteries of history. Can you please tell me who killed President Kennedy? And please don't say Oswald. <laughs> <laughs> who killed Kennedy? Uh, here's what I'll say. I don't know. Um, the Kennedy assassination is one of the topics from history I never write about and never discuss. Um, why? Because there's so much conspiracy out there. There's so much conflicting evidence. And no matter what you say, it's hard to back up and you'll anger someone. I wouldn't be surprised if in another few years, evidence is fully released and we find that a single gunman, Oswald, did it. I wouldn't be surprised. But I also wouldn't be surprised if it's something much deeper than that. I will say this, I'm not avoiding answering the question because I'm just trying to avoid it. Um, I find that you're only as good, you know, if I get nine things right and get one thing wrong, you're gonna say Watson's a lousy historian because he got that one thing wrong and forget the nine things. When it comes to the Kennedy assassination, there's just you know, no right answer except we'll just read the report and that's all we know at this particular point. I will say this though, our government uh, tends to leak worse than the Titanic. It's hard to keep a secret. Now this administration, we've never seen leakage like this, but this is not uncommon throughout history uh, you know, there's always leaks. Someone runs to write a kiss and tell book. It's almost impossible to keep something a secret unless if it's fully classified. So uh, when you come to incidents like Kennedy's assassination, uh, at, at some point there's got to be some additional stories that come out and shine further light on it. I'm not avoiding it. Just people that know me well know that that's the one topic I literally never <laughs> discuss. I'll talk about anything else under the sun. But uh, again, let me thank Felice and uh, Deborah for the, with the uh, funding campaign and Erica and Julianne and the whole team. Thank you for what you did. I hope it wasn't too nerdy. If you're interested, I'd be delighted to do another one or something a little spunkier and less nerdy. I was just trying to avoid politics and find something that was politically neutral. Uh, well, I want to say thank you, Robert, so much for taking the time to be with us today and for shedding some light on history's mysteries and always being so honest and entertaining. I want to thank everyone who is on the call for joining us. Please look for an email from us with more ways to connect with your Federation and our Jewish community. Don't forget that next week, May 5th, is Giving Tuesday with a full day of programming for you. And yes, we are privileged enough to have Dr. Watson again. We'll send you the dates. There'll be a really special surprise with him. 
And just most importantly, stay safe, stay healthy, and be well. And if you need any support or have questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.